If you're like most people, you will have just finished part one of our tour where we went through all of the reptiles in this room. And today for part two, we'll be going through the rest of the animals in our house. First, let's start in our bedroom actually, where we just have a couple of animals. In here, we have a 20 long tank with three of our female fat-tailed geckos. We have Milton here, who's just a normal with a stripe. We also have my first fat-tailed gecko, which was given to me as a leopard gecko. This is an AML mutation, striped of course. Her name is Sophie. And last but not least, we have, oh, you're in shed. This is another A-male, just a non-stripe variation. This one actually doesn't have a name yet. And this A-male we got with uh, her tail was partially regrown, so it's kind of bulbous at the end here, but she's still a great little gecko, and all three of them have had babies for us in the past, including this year we have babies from her and her. This one took the year off this year, though. In the wild, you'll see fat-tailed geckos with and without stripes. The only difference is that the stripe is a dominant trait, so it will get passed on to the young. With fat-tailed geckos, you cannot house males and females together permanently, just temporarily for breeding purposes. But females, you can house together as long as they get along, which these three ladies do, and as long as you can make sure that they all receive proper amounts of food. So we keep a close eye on them when they're eating to make sure that they're all getting enough food in their bellies. A, a difference between fat-tailed geckos and leopard geckos is, although their care is very, very similar, fat tails need slightly higher humidity in their enclosures. So in their enclosures, we give them a substrate that will retain moisture, even though it's dry right now. It's easy just to pour water in and mix it up, and then it retains that wetness. And who needs a door when you can slide underneath? Here, let me turn that for you. There. We also give them a humidity box over here that's on the warm end of their enclosure because there's a heat mat on this side and that keeps it warm and humid inside so they can go in and rehydrate and shed as needed. Next we're going to go downstairs a level and we're going to check out some of the animals in our living room. So let's go! Here we are! We're going to start down here with an animal that looks like an axolotl, but he is not one. This is a very closely related tiger salamander larva. He refuses to morph into an adult for us. We don't exactly know why, but there are some isolated populations of these found in the wild that just refuse to change. We know that he is in fact not an axolotl because of the amount of toes he has on his back legs. That's how you can confirm the difference. And it was confirmed to us by a DNR officer. But since he hasn't changed, we're just assuming that, you know, he's not going to at this point. So we just treat him like an axolotl. The only difference in their care is you don't need to provide a filter with these guys uh, like you would an axolotl. Just make sure that you change the water frequently. When we first got him, and actually for the first probably year that we had him, we had the water down about halfway with a land portion, and he just never utilized it. And it's been around three years now, and since he hasn't morphed yet, we're just assuming he's not going to. He must just like being fed, and he's comfortable where he is at his current life stage, and he's just not going to change. And that's okay, because we can still use him for educational purposes this way, having him side by side with an adult salamander to show people the difference. In these cups, you might have overlooked them, and a lot of people do, but we have a couple praying mantises in these. Of course, only one in each since they are cannibalistic, but they're cool little pets. I'm waiting until they get a little bit bigger before I do a care video on them, because they're a little hard to see right now, but they're still really interesting little guys. They are insect eaters, and care for them is as easy as misting them down once a day and feeding them once a day. This species grows to around four inches long as an adult, so they have Oh, he's probably going to quadruple in size by then. One animal that everybody always asks for updates for is Nearly Headless Nick, our now no-eyed garter snake. He originally had one eye, he was injured in a lawnmower accident, and we had that remaining eye removed because it was swelling up in size. If you want to learn more about him, watch this video right here, but I'm going to show you how he's doing. He's still kept down here on the table. He's a little too small to move with the other garter snakes quite yet. We moved him back on his favorite bedding instead of those paper towels like we had him on after surgery. Hey Nick, come here. How are you doing? This guy is doing great. He is eating better on his own now. I just have to open up his mouth and put the head of a pinky in and then he kind of takes it from there. And he'll eat twice a week because we're still trying to get some weight on him. 
He has completely healed from his eye surgery. He still does that sideways tongue flick, which I think is adorable. Very alert. He acts like a normal garter snake would. He just doesn't have eyes, so he just can't see. But that doesn't stop him from exploring around his enclosure. And once he's big enough, we will try to introduce him to our other garter snakes, and we'll see how that goes. But that might not be for a little while yet because of how little he still is. Although I, of course, love the reptiles, I also love our freshwater aquarium. This is a 75 gallon tank. It's an older style because it doesn't have the divider up top, which comes in really handy when you're siphoning because I can just reach all the way through to clean things out. Something you don't really think about, I guess, but it comes in handy. Down here, there are actually quite a few different species of fish. They're all hungry right now too. We have some gold barbs, we have some rosy barbs, there's some torpedo barbs in there. I guess I really like barbs. There's also a bala shark that is the last one from a school we used to have. And inside somewhere are clown loaches, there's several placostomus like bristle nose and a royal pleco. There's just a good variety in here. Definitely well stocked as it is. I can't add anything because I don't want to crowd the fish. But I now have fun with adding new plants inside of the tank. We have some cryptocorian green and some uh, I don't know what that one is called. We have some Anubius and some Hydra, and then up floating at the top is some Hornwort. So there's, yeah, a good variety of plants too, and everything is alive. I much prefer the look of live plants over artificial ones in aquariums, so we just have to make sure for them all to flourish, we add fertilizer twice a week. On the other side of this room, we have our newest edition, which I am super excited about, and I'm excited to be able to share them with you freely now, since I couldn't say anything until we did our unboxing video earlier this week. But inside are our Cuban false chameleons. This is a breeding group of one male and three females. And what I love about these guys is they are friendly. Like, even if they seem upset, you can just pick them right up and set them on your hand, and they could care less. And they are also big pigs. We're going to, oh. gonna jump, whoop, don't fall. Yeah, they're very graceful too. Since the females are laying eggs, I have to calcium dust all of their food to make sure they get enough calcium in their diet. Do you want this? You're welcome. <laughs> they're just so chill. These things are great. Although they're called false chameleons, they are not a species of chameleon. People just used to think they were because they can move their eyes independently like chameleons can. Oh, my finger isn't food. Here, let me give you a different, um, another piece of food. There you go. They are snail eaters in the wild, so we do have to supplement their diet with snails that you can actually buy canned. And we do that about once a week. But the rest of their food is a variety of crickets and dubia roaches. You ready to go back on your branch? Bloop. There you go. Gandalf is showing off now. Look at you. We also have one more animal over here, but since we haven't done a video of her yet, we're gonna keep her hush-hush until we introduce her later on. Now let's go downstairs another level to some of our bigger snakes. Down here, I know I said that we have bigger snakes, but we have some smaller ones too that we're going to start with. This is our community tank for garter snakes. One thing I love about garter snakes is that you can house them together and they'll learn to recognize their owners as the food bringers. So they will follow you all around the tank. This one is Twiggy. She is one that goes to programs quite often with me. So she's very used to being handled. She doesn't musk at all and she eats in front of kids at my program. So I'll usually let a kid use tweezers and feed her either a mouse or a worm or a fish or whatever she happens to be eating that day. Twiggy is a common garter snake. So the ones that you see up here in the Midwest, you can tell them apart from other garter snakes by looking at their stripe pattern. They have a dorsal stripe along their back, but they do not have any stripes on their side. Then you compare that to some other species of garter snakes like this one, which is a cross between a ribbon snake and a plains garter snake, so she's kind of unique as it is, but you can still see this side stripe down her side and there's still some black in between that stripe and her belly compared to the common garter snake, which does not have that. So to identify garter snakes, there's a lot of looking at stripes. This one is, her name is Prius because she is a hybrid, of course, haha. <laughs> and she's another one that eats at my programs. She has been a fun addition since she's so outgoing and willing to eat in front of an audience. 
Also inside of this tank, I'll put these two ladies back. By the way, we only have girls in this tank. We do have one male and he is in this tank over here because we don't want him crossbreeding with the other species in this tank. All these girls get along great. There is an albino checkered garter snake in here. We actually have two female albino checkers in here. This is one of them. She has a beautiful dorsal stripe down her back, which makes me wonder if she has some plains garter snake in her as well. Then we have what is definitely a pure checkered garter in her humidity box. And I'm not gonna take her out. This one is actually due to give birth any day. So I think she might be preparing to give birth inside of her humidity box. This is usually where she has her babies and she had her pre-lay or pre-birth shed just about a week ago. So we're expecting babies very soon from her. She goes by two names. One is Fatness Everdeen and the other one is April because last year she made us wait an extremely long time before she finally had babies, kind of like April the giraffe. There's one more garter snake in here, but she's kind of skittish. Let's see if I'll be able to take her out without her musking. Where are you? Are you down. Oh, you're going down there. This is our new California red-sided garter snake. She doesn't have very red sides, but she's beautiful regardless. She has nice blue stripes and a blue belly. She is breeding size, so we're trying to find a male, a nice pretty male to go with her. But that's been uh, pretty hard to find. <laughs> Their males are hard to come by. Now she was very skittish and bitey, striky, musky when we first got her, but a cool thing about garters is after you house them together for a while, they calm right down because they're used to that constant touching and the constant just being with other snakes and it makes them more acceptable of being handled by humans too. So that trick worked like a charm on her. Garter snakes I've found prefer a heat lamp from above that they can bask underneath as opposed to a heat mat from below. The lamp encourages natural basking behavior from them and it's kind of fun because you see them out more often than other snakes that you would use a heat mat for. And you can also spoil garter snakes with all sorts of ledges and driftwood and things to climb on and they will use every inch of their enclosure. So that's why these are kind of on display in our living room because they're so active and entertaining to watch. And here is our male. I'm sorry, I know you're separated from the ladies, but I don't want you breeding with that California red sided. Here is the male, or our dad, of the clutches of garter snakes we'll have this year. He'll be the dad of Fatness, or April's babies, and he was the dad of our hybrid baby garters, which was an accidental clutch that we got from our mistake of not separating him soon enough. In garter snakes, males stay quite a bit smaller than females, since they only need to be so large in order to get their job done, whereas females need to be extra large in order to have room to develop babies. On the other side of the room, we have three large enclosures that Ed built, and we use these for our bigger snakes, of course. On the top here, we have Doug. He is a common boa. He is full grown. He's one of our rescues. He got too big for his previous owner, and he was having a tough time carrying him around because he was a little bit elderly, so he gave him to us. And Doug has been an amazing addition as well because he goes to all the programs with me, and it looks like he's going into blue. His eyes are a little bit cloudy, and his belly is a little bit pink. That's another sign that they're about to shed. Doug here is about 12 years old. He weighs around 20 to 25 pounds, and he's just over seven feet long. And for male, he is full grown, but females would get a little bit bigger at around eight feet or so they would top off. This is actually pretty big for a male boa constrictor. They're usually closer to the six foot range as adults, but he was just a really good eater, I guess, when he was younger. I got him at this size, so I didn't raise him up. But being a good eater will make a bigger snake as an adult. Doug here eats every other month for us, every six to eight weeks, roughly. We've tried feeding him more often, but he just doesn't want to eat until six to eight weeks have passed. But I think that's because he eats such a large meal every time. We feed him rats, guinea pigs, and rabbits that have passed away from breeders' houses, and they save the bodies for us to recycle with him. So we actually don't kill anything to feed this guy. Looks like he wants to go back. We've had Doug for, what, four years now? Like We've had him for quite a while, and he has been wonderful. Underneath Doug would be our pair of false water cobras that are currently housed together for breeding purposes. This is our big female, just shows you how big false water cobras can get. She's about seven feet long, just like Doug, but a lot thinner of a snake, of course. This is a colubrid, which is a snake that isn't a python or a boa. They're generally referred to as colubrids. She is a little bit older. She's around 13 years old. She also is a little bit skittish. She's not bitey, which is good because these are mildly venomous. 
Big false water cobras I've found tend to back up to get out of your hands instead of move forward. So that's what she's doing here is she's just backing up and she doesn't hold her body up right as much as she used to when she was younger, but that's okay. She's just showing her age a little bit, which is why we're okay not getting babies from her anymore. She's probably just decided to retire herself from breeding. She is also in shed. False water cobras are native to South America, so they like pretty high humidity levels. But inside these enclosures, it's hard to maintain high humidity levels, even with moisture retaining substrate. So instead we use humidity boxes so they can kind of go in and out of them as they please to monitor their own humidity levels. I think the male is actually inside of the humidity box. Yep, there he is. Come here, buddy. We just have a bunch of sphagnum moss inside of their box to keep humidity levels high. Levels high. Hey girly, why don't you stay in there, please? Here is our male. We had to close the enclosure because the female was trying to escape. He has some growing still to do. Although he's young, he is big enough to breed. He's just a small adult. These can also get upwards of six or seven feet, usually closer to six for males. Females get a little bit bigger. And these are technically a mildly venomous species. So there's some controversy on how to hold them and whether you should use gloves or not. I personally don't use gloves because I know that these snakes, if they were to bite you, they have enlarged rear fangs or really just big teeth. They're not actually fangs. And they have to chew their venom into their prey in order for it to be affected by it. So if you're bit by a false water cobra, you kind of have to wedge your hand into the back of their mouth in order to access those large teeth and let them gnaw on you for several minutes before you get any sort of reaction. And that reaction would be localized swelling at the bite site, as well as some um, itchiness and maybe some soreness. And you might get, from what I hear, diarrhea for a couple of days. So I don't want to get bit by this snake, of course, but I trust the snake and I know that even if I were to get bit, it wouldn't kill me. There aren't any recorded deaths from a false water cobra bite. They're called the false water cobra because they hood up like a cobra does when they're threatened or sometimes when they're just excited and they're eating, but they don't hold their body upright like a cobra does. They hold their body more horizontal even when they're hooded up. So that's one of the differences between the two, as well as not being venomous like an actual cobra is. All right, dude, do you wanna follow your lady or? Yep, going back in your box, figures. I just have these two together for breeding purposes. It's not recommended to house them together permanently. Beneath them, we have one bull snake. This is our big mama. Her name is Brad because we accidentally named her boyfriend Janet when we thought he was a girl at first. So we decided to just stick with the theme and we named her Brad. She, oh, you're also in blue. Everyone's shedding here. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm waking you up. Hey, girly. She's, she's got your typical bull snake attitude, especially when she's in shed. So she's not the uh, friendliest right now. I probably won't pick her up because I don't have a hook handy and I don't really want to annoy her. There's no reason for me to take her out. The snake is also very food motivated and since it's feeding day today, she is probably expecting food right now. So I'm also going to leave her alone for that reason. The first year we bred Brad, she had 15 eggs, 11 of which hatched. The second year she had 25 eggs and all of those babies hatched. And this year she had 22 eggs, so a bunch of big clutches recently. And her babies are due to hatch in like four weeks from now. So we should be getting babies from her pretty soon. What I'm going to do with this snake is since she is in blue, I just noticed, I will be giving her a humidity box to use until she sheds, but I don't keep a humidity box in with bull snakes permanently because they tend to use them too much to the point where they start to get like scale rot issues on their bellies. So I only offer humidity boxes to bull snakes when they are currently in the shedding process. We have one more level of our house and it contains quite a few animals, but probably the most popular animal on our channel. So let's go, high five. Whoa, wait, this isn't right. Let's, let's try that again. That's better. <laughs> All right. So down here we have our turtles, since I do a turtle program for schools and scouts and libraries, things like that. So I do native turtles since that's what teachers want me to teach their students about. We have Shelly. She is a painted turtle. Shelby, which is a map turtle. And this nosy guy is Pancake. He is a spiny soft shell turtle. We used to have one more painted turtle in here, a smaller one named Michelle, about this big. And she was my absolute favorite turtle. We got her and she was severely stunted because she was kept in a small tank her entire life. She was actually quite old despite her size. And one day we came down and her physical disability because of neglect in the previous home 
got the best of her and we sadly did lose Michelle. So that has been a really sad thing that's happened recently because we truly do miss Michelle. She was amazing. Uh, but we just have the three turtles in this 75 gallon tank now. And underneath them, we have three stink pots. They're also called common musk turtles. There's actually one over here in the corner. These are one of the Earth's smallest species of turtle. Oh, you're hungry too. Ha -ha. Oh, are there? Oh, there's <laughs> another one. Nice, climbing around. There's a third. Yep, there she is. These grow to a max size of about three to four inches, and when they are hatchlings, they're about the size of a penny. So they are teeny tiny. We have them in this mansion of a 40 gallon tank, a male and two females with a lay box up on their basking platform. They never come out and bask since they are almost a completely aquatic species of turtle. But if they do feel the inspiration to breed, which we would love, they will have a lay box ready for them when that time comes. Since stink pots aren't the best of swimmers and they spend the majority of their time at the bottom of the body of water, they need sinking pellets instead of floating pellets. So we give them these that they chow down on. Come on up. That filter's blowing a lot of bubbles. Come on up. Get it. Get you it, can dude. get it. Get it, dude. You got it. Oh, it's so much work to swim when you're a stink pot. It's okay, they're stinking. There you go. They'll also eat minnows and worms and pretty much anything we give them. They, however, are not fast enough to catch a few of the minnows in their aquarium. So a few fish just get to live in a 40 gallon tank. Wow, they are quick. No wonder they're still alive. Now behind me is not just any closet. It's a heated closet for Ed's green tree pythons. Inside, I'm gonna have to move this like that. Inside we have, how many green trees do you have now? Six. Six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have seven. Yeah, we have, oh, it is so warm in here. That is okay. On the end, we have an aru and a sarong. You can't really see them since they're in these totes, but you can see them hopefully well enough. We have a biak in here that's transitioning. He was bright red when we first got him, and it's just amazing to watch them change from red to yellow and then finally to their adult color of green. This is our newest addition, the Meraki that we got from their most recent Tinley show. Just another locale green tree to add to the group, and hopefully we can breed her with the sarong that's over here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to open that. Yeah, that's going to be hard. That'll be hard. He has some beautiful blues in his scales, so we could maybe incorporate those into some of their babies. These three larger enclosures are all biox. There is a male in here. His name is Kronk. He is a little cranky from time to time. But he is uh, our breeder male, and we are attempting to pair him up with our female biox, like this one right here. This is Cruella. Oh, she's all huffy. I don't know if you can hear that, but, oh, haha, -ha, there's a strike. All right, I'll leave you alone. We're also hoping to breed Kronk, our male, with Dolores here. She is the most handleable Biak green tree that we have. Green trees are known for being pretty sassy, especially the Biaks, but captive bred ones are a lot more handleable than wild caught or farm raised. So by captive breeding these guys, we can hopefully get some really handleable green tree pythons to offer in the future. But if you know how to read their body language, you can handle just about any Biak green tree python. We actually made a video all about how to handle an aggressive green tree that I will put right here. I do apologize for it being pretty dark in this room, but it's hard to fit our filming light in here, so we'll just have to make do with what we've got. Since this room is heated for the green tree pythons at around 85 to 87 degrees, we use it for an incubator for our snake eggs. Since heat rises, the upper shelves are a warmer temperature than down below, down here, it's around 80 degrees, which is the perfect incubation temperature for hognose snake eggs and bull snake eggs. Check this out. We have, these are hognoses. These are hognoses. These are bull snake eggs. And these are bull snake eggs. Bull snake eggs. Bull snake eggs. And more bull snake eggs. We have a lot of bull snakes on the way. It's gonna be so much fun in just a couple of weeks from now. In about two weeks, actually, uh, probably about four or five days after we publish this video, these two containers of eggs will be ready to hatch. So we will be doing a live egg cutting when they start to hatch. And we will be keeping the Facebook page, Snake Discovery, and the Twitter page, and the community tab on the YouTube page updated as to when we'll do the live egg cutting so you can be a part of it too. You may have noticed some other containers here. These are our dud eggs that we're incubating just in case 
Um, they're actually not as smelly as I thought they would be. I have seen snakes hatch from really gross looking eggs. I doubt we'll get anything from any of these, but we're incubating them just in case. However, we do have them separated from all the others, so if they have something that would spread, it's separated so it won't spread to the good eggs. The last eggs we have down here are our newest species, the false chameleon. They lay eggs anywhere from one to six eggs a month. And we have, we've had them for about three weeks now, and we already have a nice selection of eggs. However, the first couple do not appear to be fertile and there is some mold growing on them. So we may separate those a little bit more, but that one, that one, and that one still look good. We still have to candle them, but we might have false chameleons on the way too. Finally, on the other side of this wall, we have Chloe, who is our snapping turtle. She's actually really friendly. She just thinks I have food. She is friendly as far as snapping turtles go. She doesn't strike in aggression, you know, very often anyway. If it's been a while since I've handled her, I might get a strike or, two, or a snap or two, but she's just wiggly, if anything. She is, I think, a little bit stunted since she was also kept in a tank that was too small for her. But, you know, she's actually doing really well and we just recently upgraded her from one of these tanks behind me to a 100 gallon watering trough built for horses. But we kind of renovated it for her. So now she has plenty of space to swim around in. The last thing we have to add to her enclosure is a UVB light on top. But snapping turtles are one of the only species of turtles where you don't need a basking platform for them since they spend so much time underwater. Finally, the animal everyone's been waiting for is Rex. This is our American alligator. He is now 31 years old and he should be around 12 feet long at his age. But I mean, a lot of you have heard his story, so I won't really go into details, but he was kept in a very small box with lack of proper lighting, lack of food, as much as he should have been fed anyway. Well, calm down. He gets the most excited for feeding night out of all of our animals, and he is also expecting treats from us right now. Rex, I'm not feeding you right now. It's okay. You should know this by now. No, I'm not feeding you. We renovated a guest bedroom for him, so he has plenty of room now, and his pool is heated and filtered, and it's actually combined with the same heater and filter that Chloe's water has, and it's just one big cycle. The water will drain from her bin down into his pool, then get sucked up by the filter back there, which has guards around it so Rex can't tip it over again, and then it will push that clean water back into Chloe's tank, and the whole cycle goes around again. Now he's gonna pout because we don't have food for the majesty. Rex did not like the idea of having a roommate initially when we moved Chloe into this feeding or watering trough. And after a few days, we saw him once inside of her trough swimming around with her. Thankfully, nothing happened, but we didn't want to risk anything happening. So we added these guards, which kind of remind me of a hockey rink. And now he cannot go into her enclosure anymore. And instead, he just has his pool, which is still plenty big enough for him, as well as the rest of the room. The basket over here, as well as the brick holding it back, kind of protects all the tubing that goes into his pool. Otherwise he grabs it and he barrel rolls it and pulls it out and then this leaks. So it's been a learning process having an alligator. And that's everybody, except for a select few animals that we didn't include for various reasons, including a carpet python that we have just temporarily, but I have a video about her coming out soon. We also left out a couple different animals that you don't even know of yet because we haven't introduced them yet. And finally, we did leave out the Burmese python and Ed's reticulated pythons because they have outgrown their enclosures and Ed is currently building new enclosures for them, which we're excited about. So we'll just do a video of them in their new enclosures when they're completed. Thanks for following us around our house to let us show you all of the animals that we live with. And again, thank you for the support. And this is again, a celebration of 100,000 subscribers and we still can't believe that we've made it that far. Thank you again for everything. Now I always have to ask this after a tour, which animal was your favorite? Comment below and we'll see you next time. Feed me. <laughs>